The Tom Woods Show, episode 2042. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Harry's, the official razor of The Tom Woods Show, is offering listeners their starter set at harrys.com slash woods. That's a five-blade razor, a weighted ergonomic handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel blade cover, a $13 value, all for just $3 at harrys.com slash woods. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to be joined today by Eli Klein, who owns the Eli Klein Gallery, an art gallery you can find in Manhattan. And he has come on my radar because of his presence on Twitter, where he has been a consistent critic of the COVID policies there, uh, even though he's not right of center or anything like that, and nor should you have to be to be against this craziness. But he's taken a pretty bold position on this and has said that under no circumstances is he going to ask for vaccination status when people are seeking to enter his gallery. So a lot to talk about with Eli Klein, but make sure you don't turn off this episode after the interview portion is over because there's something I want to tell you about regarding a trip I'm taking, and it's an opportunity for me to meet a few of you. No, this is not the Tom Woods announcement, but it is an event, a small-scale event, that I'd like you to be aware of, and I'll give you the details of that at the end of the episode. Eli, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. I'm so glad we're able to have this conversation. I've followed you on Twitter for I don't know how long, and doggone it, I don't know how many times I have hit the retweet button or commented on your stuff or quote tweeted it, but I just think, gosh, this guy sounds like me just with a few more F-bombs than I would normally use. I, I just, <laughs> I love your commentary and, and I I feel for you. You know, I had um, a couple people on you, you may know. I know you know Clifton Duncan, who used to uh-huh. live in New York as a Broadway actor. But then recently I also had Carol Markowitz on who relocated oh, right. from New York City down to Florida. And we all had the same feeling of, profound feeling of loss because I, you know, I went to graduate school in New York and then I lived on Long Island for a while. And I know the problems with New York. It's not perfect like any place, but man, it's full of life. There have been many times I've flown up to New York feeling kind of down and just walking through the city has rejuvenated me. And so much of it is so meaningful to me. And this sense that I'm shut out of it if not forever, then at least for the indefinite future, is profoundly alienating for me. And I mean, I know that it's not quite the same for you, but it's a still a very, very confusing and depressing time. Right. I, you know, look, I think the fact that anybody would feel alienated or shut out in and of itself is just, you know, representative of a massive self-inflicted wound and self-created problem. I mean, that's not who I was raised to be. That's not the New York that I come from. You know, I'm, I'm born and raised in Greenwich Village. I've you know, been here my whole life. And it's, you know, I think the reason why I'm so loud and, and have been is because I do find it, you know, just so appalling. And, you know, while I feel like it's important for me to speak for other people because, you know, there's been this odd, you know, failure to, I think, adequately contest what should be very controversial policy and just to accept and accept it, you know, what what are now years on end, even without any, you know, measurement of success where there's, you know, clear negatives, right? And I'm sorry, you know, I consistently find myself apologizing on behalf of New York for ostracizing people and making them feel unwelcome. And it's just, it's a disgrace. And it's embarrassing for me as a lifelong New Yorker to have suddenly really, you know, living in this, what I call, you know, unapologetically extremism. And it really is extremism to ban unvaccinated people from New York, to force tourists to, you know, vaccinate their you know, prior infected five-year-olds in order to go to a museum. I mean, this, this stuff isn't, it's not reasonable given that these vaccines, unfortunately, haven't reduced or meaningfully reduced transmission in New York City. It's not the government's position, job, or, or right to tell visitors what kind of 
medical intervention they have to take in order to you know visit my art gallery, for example. And it it really, really, really is appalling from any rational civil liberties perspective. And I find myself in a very awkward position where I wouldn't feel right if I didn't stand up against these really, you know, unscientific, unnecessary, abusive, overreaching, authoritative rules. I want to get to your story in a minute, but I first want to ask you a little bit about Eric Adams, the new mayor, because isn't this interesting? On the one hand, he speaks very forcefully against locking the city down, and he understands the pros and cons of this, and that the cons are huge cons, and we can't even consider doing that, and it would damage the city, not to mention. But then on the other hand, he wants to enforce, in just as authoritarian a style, the kinds of exclusionary policies, primarily these mandates for public places, that his predecessor introduced. And these will damage the city at least as much because, as you said on Twitter, there's nobody who's going to vacation in New York City because they have a vaccine passport system. But there are many, many countless, countless people in the U.S. and all over the world who will proactively and without a doubt stay home from New York City or choose an alternative to New York City. So, I mean, I wonder, on the one hand, the guy is clear enough minded among Democratic politicians to say this is a dumb policy to shut the city down. But he can't see that this other policy is equally suicidal. Right. No, of course. And in many of the same ways, it hurts you know, many of the same people, right? When you effectively ban hundreds of millions of tourists from New York City, that affects everybody. And you know, when hotels can't stay open, you know, their staff can't feed their families. And, and it really, it does many of the exact same harmful things that he spoke out about lockdown doing. So I think on one hand, you're exactly right. It's just, it just very hypocritical and doesn't make sense. On another hand, I think it's very important to always remember this, right? And in, in that one unfortunate thing about all COVID restrictions and, and mandates is that when they're in force at times of COVID waves, like we're in now, you know, we're kind of plateauing and we had a peak or whatnot. It's almost impossible politically for Mayor Adams, for example, to remove a mask mandate and these vaccine verification systems in the middle of a COVID wave this big just because of optics and other things. So, you know, the optimist in me certainly hopes that as this Omicron wave drops very quickly that in the next few weeks, he will align his positions with, with his anti-lockdown you know, lockdown stance, which of course is removing the mask mandate and removing these vaccine mandates. And you know, if he doesn't, then it's obviously just completely, totally hypocritical and ridiculous. And if he does, and I hope that he does, what also needs to happen is he has to provide New Yorkers with assurances that he'll never do this again, right? Because, you know, we can't be living in a state of constant fear that our businesses will be closed, that tourists will be banned, that capacity limits will be implemented, that a mask mandate will be, will be implemented. A mask mandate affects all aspects of life. And you know, absolutely makes people less likely to go out and spend money to go to the theater, to go to the galleries, to go to museums, to go anywhere, even to come to New York, right? So the problem is not just they're continuing these these restrictions, which, you know, haven't measurably helped us into 2022, but it's really going to necessitate a firm stance that, hey, look, you know, we're sorry these are done, but it's not just that. We promise that we'll never do it again. Because, you know, New York will never be able to, to get a business that has an opportunity to open in Miami or New York City, for example, to choose New York City in the future if that business will be subject to COVID restrictions indefinitely. Yeah. 
right? So that's what Who really would hurts. start it there? You'd start it somewhere else. You'd start the business somewhere else. Now, I just, I just saw an article in the New York Post about restaurant owners, and they're saying they like what they're hearing from the new mayor more than they liked what they were hearing from the de Blasio people, whose approach to restaurants, they say, was more or less eat shit and die. Whereas they say that Adams really does seem to want to help them and rejuvenate the city and this and that. So if they have his ear, eventually what they have to say in his ear is, we can't function as restaurants if you're going to demand that every kid has to show vaccine proof in the city, much less, you know, all the rest of the world. Now, with regard to the vaccination thing, when New York hit that magic 70 percent number and Cuomo said, OK, now we can lift the restrictions. My thought was, all right, maybe the vaccines for people who never had COVID or who are very, very concerned about it, maybe this will be what they need psychologically even, maybe even just psychologically to return to normal life. So maybe maybe it serves that purpose for them. And then we can all just move on. You would think I would have put two and two together having followed this so closely. This thing that looked like it could be the key to getting people to go back to their normal lives became an instrument of tyranny. It became an instrument of still more restrictions on people's lives. And I'm sorry that I wasn't astute enough to see that coming. You know, I didn't either. And I've seen a lot of this stuff coming. But no, I I mean, I think what I call vaccine extremism was completely unpredictable, you know, partially because of how counterintuitive and counterproductive it is, right? You know, so many of these vaccine rules, you know, I think especially disregarding the prior infected are really so unscientific and bizarre that, you know, one doesn't see this level of extremism coming. I mean, you know, why would you, you know, force people with, I mean, look, we've never in our history forced people to vaccinate against a disease they already have immunity to, right? It's really kind of a a weird, tyrannical overreach that I think really sets a dangerous precedent. You know, if we can do that, then we can do a lot of other things. I think that's a really shocking part. But I think vaccine extremism was really unpredictable. And you see just this kind of groupthink and tribalism almost or whatever it is. But, you know, the worse things seem to get, the more, you know, they're just doubling down on it. And it's just really incredible. I mean, the city of New York would force, you know, I have a friend with, you know, a eight and nine year old kid who just had COVID. They weren't vaccinated. So the whole family had COVID. The kids likely had Omicron and are fine, of course. But, you know, the idea that New York City and they live in, in Brooklyn that New York City prohibits them from doing, you know, really activities central to daily life without, you know, taking a vaccine that's, you know, based on this, you know, two-year-old wild type COVID after they have Omicron specific immunity with Omicron dominant here. You know, there's frankly no basis in science whatsoever for these kids to be forced to take this vaccine that may well not benefit them at all. And, you know, who are we to tell parents that are worried for one reason or the other that they have to force their kids to take a vaccine that really there's no data showing that that these vaccines would benefit kids who had Omicron. I'm just giving one example, but so it really is vaccine extremism. And it's something that I don't blame you at all for not predicting. It is so wild, so bizarre, so new, and so kind of surreal that I think it would have been difficult for most people to predict it. Hey, folks, just a quick word from our sponsor, the official razor of the Tom Woods Show, Harry's, and a little suggestion from all Woods here, gentle suggestion to the libertarian world. How about we resolve this year to be well-groomed? It's the beginning of 2022, time for fresh starts and resolutions. Well, why not resolve to look your best? And you can look your best with Harry's, which is an award-winning razor brand that makes a full range of grooming essentials. I absolutely cannot live without the shave gel, which combines with the Harry's razor itself to give me the smoothest, most comfortable and close shave I have ever had. 
I started using Harry's maybe six or seven years ago and I've never looked back. Because why would I? Close, comfortable shave at a fair price, still as low as $2 a blade. The blades are designed to stay sharp longer. And they found in a recent study that guys who shave four times a week said their eighth shave was as smooth as their first. Well, Harry's is giving their best offer to our listeners. New Harry's customers can redeem a starter set. You get a five-blade razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blades when you're on the go. That's a $13 value for just $3. There's truly never been a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash woods to try Harry's today. Let's talk a little bit about you specifically, because my understanding, having followed some of your writing, is that you are not, given your the stance that you've taken on all this stuff, you don't fit the tidy little profile that the media likes to portray of people who have dissident views on this. It's all they have this cartoonish view of the world that you have all the scientific and rational people and those are from the center left to the far left. And then you have people who, for reasons no one can figure out, are just opposed to science per se. They they just have a bizarre refusal to accept progress and science and they just want to obstruct what the public health officials are recommending for really no good reason. And so we have good and bad people, angels and devils, and you kind of mess with that because you're not a Fox News person. And by the way, there are people who are Fox News and MSNBC are not the entirety of the American political spectrum, but in the media's view, they are. And you don't neatly fall to that part of that spectrum that they want you to fall. So what are your, like, what have been your political views and identities right. over the years? Right, I think that's a great point. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat. My parents are, you know, civil rights attorneys. My mother was a director at the ACLU. My father is a international human rights and criminal defense law professor, among other things. I think some of that comes into play where, for one reason or the other, the ACLU and the NYCLU have failed to protect people's civil liberties when it comes to COVID, which is a whole nother thing. And I find just incredible and outrageous. But I mean, I think that it would seem normal that someone who is super concerned with civil rights and civil liberties would be against restrictions on those liberties, especially when they haven't proven to be beneficial and certainly haven't proven to have a net benefit. So yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't fit the mold. And sometimes people assume that, that oh, I um, might be this kind of, you know, right wing, whatever. And, you know, that's not me. I'm just someone who is thinking about everything rationally, who sees New York bleeding unnecessarily. And I've seen it for a long time, you know, our wacko, our terrible COVID policies really started with Cuomo very early. And I was speaking out, you know, since early April of 2020, when he started, you know, lying about child COVID risk for some bizarre reasons. I, you know, these kind of things really kind of took me aback. And I I knew how much it would hurt New York to use COVID to scare parents unnecessarily and really lie and exaggerate risks for a political gain, which, you know, I saw him doing early and often. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I wish that, you know, more Democrats would stand up. I think that there are a lot more that feel the same way I do, but I own my own business, right? Um, you know, and often they don't and they work for other people and they have, you know, they're worried about their careers by speaking up against this stuff. So it even, you know, pushes me to try to have a louder voice because I I feel like I'm speaking for so many people without agency. Well, now that leads me to a couple of follow-up questions because I'm curious over the course of these, I I can't even believe I'm saying a couple of years. (laughs) Those words have to leave my mouth. I would suppose that it's quite likely that you've gotten to know people you wouldn't ordinarily have thought you'd be getting to know or socializing with or being friendly with and found, hey, you know what? You know, okay, maybe they're wrong about eight out of 10 things, but they're okay people after all. They're not quite the troglodytes that I've been told that they would be. I mean, 
Has there been a silver lining in that maybe some of the new crowd, that at least you moved with online, is uh, you know, you've gotten to meet people who are somewhat unlike yourself, and it turns out they ain't so bad. Yeah, for sure. And I never, you know, I never thought they were so. I've always been very accepting of people from all spectrums of life. And, you know, growing up in Greenwich Village, you know, you kind of have to be yeah, in a way. So I, I never had these kinds of negative thoughts about the other side. Well, you know, I guess I have just like everyone else, but, you know, nothing vicious. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly nice to communicate with a lot of people who, you know, I generally wasn't communicating with before this. And I've always tried to stay apolitical and, you know, even not speak about any political issues, to be honest, because I own an art gallery and I don't want to alienate half my clientele, right? And when I started talking about COVID, that was the first time really that I, you know, outwardly started expressing these views. And I didn't really even realize in the beginning that they would turn political. I didn't look at them as political at all. I looked at them as kind of, you know, science and data driven. And and what are you doing? I mean, why are you keeping New York City closed in the summer of 2020 when there's very little COVID here and we can just open and we, you know, and why are they keeping schools closed longer than they should? You know, all this kind of things. And it turned very political, I think, because, you know, the careers of the politicians who made these huge mistakes are now are now hinging on that they double down on these huge mistakes because if they admit that all oh, that the lockdowns went on way too long, that the school closures were unnecessary, that masking two year olds is a net negative, that vaccine extremism is actually anti vax. You know, if they admit all of these things, then of course it is detrimental to their career. So we're in kind of this odd, vicious circle. And unfortunately, it's taken on these political tones, which I didn't necessarily start opening my mouth to get involved in. And it just, you know, is what it is. But I don't like when people assume my politics based on COVID views, because COVID views shouldn't be political. And, you know, I I kind of pride myself on being apolitical about the whole thing. But it's really hard when so much of it is politicized. Well, how about by contrast, people who had been friends of yours, have you had some of the problems that I've heard other people have had where people make the personal political and vice versa, and it becomes very hard to maintain those friendships? You know, not so much. Well, that makes Uh, me happy to hear that. Yeah, not so much. I mean, I hope that it hasn't reflected negatively on my gallery. And, you know, I think that one really important aspect of it is that you know, what I've been you know, tweeting about or saying is on the record, right? And my record for getting the big issues correct, for being right on overarching policy and criticisms and everything is, is really, sorry to be so cocky about this, but it's really stellar in a way and, and far better than most. I've made some mistakes on smaller things, you know, mostly around one or two issues and have, you know, readily admitted and update my views have you know no problem doing that, but overall on the big issues, I've generally been correct. And you know, I think when push comes to shove, if it were the other way, if you know, if I was wrong in the long run, then it would really I, I really took a risk. It would devastate my life and my business. But you know, when push comes to shove, I'm I'm really able to, you know, look myself in the eye and look people who I talk to in the eye and say, hey, you know. I was right about all these issues or most of these issues. And, you know, frankly, uh, you know, you weren't. And, you know, we've devastated and diminished the lives of an entire generation of children, really unnecessarily for no gain in any, you know, COVID outcome. You know, I think that's really an, an issue that's been central to my advocacy, schools and children. And, you know, what's been done there is just, uh, you know, it it can keep you up at night. I mean, it's so disturbing in not knowing the long-term ramifications and the unfathomable harm that we've done to people and, you know, how the most disadvantaged have been hurt disproportionately. You know, that's not how I was raised and it's not how Democrats are supposed to behave. 
You know, we're supposed to look out for the poorest people. And really, COVID policy has done the opposite of that. Now, your art gallery, how long have you had it and what part of the city is it in? Uh, so I, I've been, I've had my art gallery going on 15 years now, believe it or not. And I started in Soho, then I moved to Chelsea, now I'm in West Village. So, you know, always close. And so I'm on my third space right now. I'm on Charles and West Street. I renovated a landmark federal style row house and, you know, have a great space. I live close by as well. And, you know, I've always, as I said before, I'm, you know, born and raised in Greenwich Village. And now uh, having my gallery in the West Village is is fantastic. I mean, I, I'd love to just, you know, stay in this space as, for the rest of my life, as far as I'm concerned. But my focus is on living Chinese artists, which is a whole, you know, separate thing, of course. And I have concentrated on representing, you know, Chinese contemporary art in America and in New York, of course, for about 15 years. And, you know, I've published around 40 books on the subject and uh, hosted or, you know, I've been responsible for, you know, I think over 100 exhibitions and collaborate with museums all over the world and deal with special projects and media opportunities and so on and so forth. So, you know, I've had a very active, you know, contemporary art gallery. Well, that's that's very interesting. I have a friend who's Japanese, who's a contemporary artist, uh, Hisako Kobayashi. She's the wife of Gene Epstein, who used to be with Barron's. Okay. And I love stuff like that. That's, see, that's one of the... Your gallery is exactly the kind of surprising thing that I love about New York. Now, where I live now, the part of Florida where I live now, I would never walk down the street and happen upon something as unique as that. That was what made New York wonderful. You could be walking down a random block you'd never been down before, and there's some amazing little magical little shop or something that you would never imagine, and there it is sitting there. You know, and That's the thing that I, I miss. But yet, you've said that you are not going to check people's vaccination status to enter your gallery. Now, you have to – I think you got on CNN for that. Was it CNN you were interviewed? I was. I wasn't put on for that. I think if, you know – if they knew I was going to say that, I probably wouldn't have been put on. Oh, so I, oh well, how, how did you get on then? I've been on CNN a, a couple times on this. One on about an impending mask mandate, which didn't go into effect. And I explained why it's not just a mask and the other devastating effects it would have on New York. And then another time before the vaccine verification mandate, they had me on with a, a restaurant owner who you know, loved it. And I explained why it wasn't good and, and whatnot. But I was on, you know, CNN before I knew that I would be expected to check vaccine credentials at my gallery, right? You know, all of a sudden, I woke up one morning and see that, you know, art galleries have to check the vaccine credentials of our visitors. And I was really thrown aback by that news. And knew immediately that it would never happen. I, I adjusted. Hey, everybody, a very quick message from our other sponsor today, and that is Skillshare. The last couple of years have really, really beaten a lot of us down. But here's a small way to bring a new source of joy into your life, something that takes you out of your comfort zone, something you haven't tried before, something that you can look forward to. Skillshare is a platform that brings thousands and thousands of classes on a huge variety of topics into the comfort of your home. And these are topics that appeal to the creative side of you. So music, photography, illustration, graphic design, fine art, film and video, including independent film, photography, web development, business analytics, marketing, freelance and entrepreneurship, and a lot more. These are short, specific, to-the-point classes that can work with your schedule and give you the opportunity to interact with and get feedback from a community of other creative people. I have a bunch of creative daughters, and one of them is interested in Martina Flores' class, Be Your Own Boss, Strategies for Launching Your Creative Career. So not only do you learn the artistic side, but you can also learn how to market yourself. Plus, because you know me, you can try it out for a month for free and see what you think. But you're going to love it, and it's going to help bring joy into your life, and we could all use that right about now. So explore your creativity at Skillshare.com woods, where our listeners get a one-month free trial. That's one month free at Skillshare.com slash Woods. Well, on Twitter, you I know you know this because you did it, but I'm just telling people you made a maybe like a six-second 
clip of your appearance on CNN. Then you also included the full interview, but the clip where you say, look, I am not going to enforce a policy that basically bans more than half the black people of the city from entering my gallery. I'm just not going to do that. And the way you edited the clip, you have, after you say that, you just include the CNN anchor saying, uh, and then you end the clip because that is, a, I mean, I don't know if you did that on purpose, but that is a perfect ending to that clip. Uh, because what, what are they going to say yeah. to that? I mean, it, it's really how the whole uh, segment ended, actually. The whole five minute segment ended that way. So I didn't take it too far out of context. It was a, you know, certainly a good but correct soundbite. Uh, look, I mean, it clearly has a disparate impact. And, you know, that's one reason why I would never enforce it. Um, I wasn't raised to discriminate against people. You know, I, but but they're going to come after you. You know, eventually they're going to come after something. I mean, push could come to shove any any day now. Yeah, you know, it, it is what it is. I'm not going to be forced to discriminate against people. I mean, there has to be you know some level of standing up here, and that crosses my line. I'm never going to ask someone for their vaccine credentials to enter my art gallery for any number of reasons. I can give, and I have given very you know detailed analysis of why i wouldn't do it and you know i won't bore you with all the little reasons here but it would be completely inappropriate and unscientific for me to do that and it's not how i was raised i don't discriminate i couldn't ethically feel appropriate with myself doing it and it's simply definitely never going to happen does anybody come in and complain that they're not asked to show their credentials at your gallery no, no. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I don't know what the state of mind is of New Yorkers right now. Right. I haven't no, been there I, in I two years. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what would it take for you to become a Carol Markowitz, who's somebody who absolutely dearly loved New York City the way I did and never imagined a life where she wasn't raising her kids there and now she's in South Florida? Right. Now, it's not that Florida is the only option that people have, but my point is, what would have to happen for you to say, this is not tenable, even I have to go? Well, I, you know, look, my dad lives near me. My brother lives near me. My wife is firmly rooted with a great job here. My gallery is firmly rooted here. You know, I can't just pick up and leave. It would take a lot. Yeah. Look, I'd love to pack it all up and move to Miami, right? But it's just not not practical or reasonable and you would rather stay and fight. Are you disappointed about, and this is almost a rhetorical question, I'm sorry to ask a rhetorical question, but by how little pushback there has been from business owners like yourself? Yeah, I'm beyond disappointed. It's appalling and it's a huge mistake. And I think a lot of them realize, hey, I, I should have stood up with Eli. He was right, right? These vaccine passports failed. We discriminated against people unscientifically for no reason at all. You know, we've compromised our integrity and should have refused and spoke out about it in the beginning. But I can understand why a lot of people can't. I understand why a lot of people don't. But certainly, you know, this being the once proud city, it is shocking that more haven't joined me in what seems like uh, an obvious cause. I don't know firsthand because, as I've said, I haven't been there and I don't have vaccine credentials to show, so I wouldn't be able to do anything. But it sounds to me like the restaurants are more or less enforcing it. Is it being enforced super precisely? Or, and uh, no, You know, it depends. A lot, no, and some a little bit more. And, you know, the governor has made it now like a felony or a crime or something to forge a vaccine passport. So I think that scares people that were cheating. But the average restaurant is not doing anything other than taking a quick glance at that thing, I would assume. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a correct analysis. But of course, you know, look, part of its disparate impact is that if a black couple or a black family walk into the average restaurant, you know, will they get looked at harder? Will they look at their vaccine record compared to their ID to make sure they match more, either because of, you know, some kind of subconscious bias or discrimination or 
knowing that the rate is, of vaccination is a little bit less among Black New Yorkers. You know, that's part of the disparate impact, right? And it's part of the whole uncomfortability of the process. You know, now you're putting, you know, hostesses or whoever in these incredibly bizarre, awkward situations. And, you know, that, that's another problem. I am trying to be an optimist through this whole thing. And there are, maybe not as much in New York, but there are in some places some signs that, let's say, our point of view is gradually being conceded, just in the face of the facts. We don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do about the mandates just yet uh, as we record this. But I don't know, I still feel like, little by little, maybe they've overreached. Like, for example, Adam's trying to get all the kids vaccinated for school is an overreach. He's, that's not going to happen. I don't think. And right. trying to get everybody, oh, you know, get five-year-olds to show a vaccine card to get into doing anything. I think every time they do something hysterical like this, they wake up at least a chunk of the normal people. And by normal people, I just mean people who aren't really invested either way or just trying to live their lives and do the best they can. I think more and more of them get awakened by this. Do you think there are any, like, what do you look for? Yeah, I, look, uh, I, you know, I agree, for I agree with you completely. Yeah. I agree with you completely. I mean, we've seen the wall on the other side crumbling for a long time now, which is amazing how they're still able to double down. But I, I think yeah. you know, the problem is that you know such a small percentage of people are controlling these huge decisions. And But you're right. I mean, there's only a certain amount of craziness, hopefully, that you know can be tolerated. And you know we've seen people cross the road time and time again. And, and you know, certainly it seems as, you know, while the, the data and the science and, you know, everything that makes sense is overwhelmingly on the side of rational people like myself, we certainly are gaining, you know, allies all the time. And, and it's not as though all of these wrong decisions, even when they're doubling down on them, are gaining an audience, right? So you're right. The position is really weakening with the general public. And I think we'll see that in in the election. Yeah, that will be interesting. That will be interesting. And I really wonder about where the general public is on this because they, it's like the general public is of two minds on it. On the one hand, they feel like outwardly they need to comply and wear the mask and hound people who aren't wearing them. But then they go to see the Rolling Stones or whatever. And as soon as they start performing, the mask comes right off. But then the very next day, they're right back to hectoring people. I don't know. Or maybe maybe the people who go to a Rolling Stones concert aren't the hectoring sort. I, I don't even know what to make of this. But it's like there are two different slices of America living uncomfortably side by side with one another that live according to completely different principles. So I don't know what that means. Does it mean that in some areas of the country, you could successfully run a political campaign based on, go screw yourself, we're not living like this anymore? Probably. But if you were to run a national campaign on all this was BS and none of it did any good, would you get enough traction to win? I'm not sure we're there yet. I'm curious about that. Right. Yeah, I'm curious too. And I'll just say we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we will see. All right, as we wrap up, people should follow you. Certainly they should follow you on Twitter because as I say, I get tremendous pleasure, even though most of what I like from you is harsh denunciations. But for some reason, my <laughs> shriveled heart takes pleasure in things like that. How do they follow you? Well, I, on Twitter, it's just the Eli Klein. So E-L-I-K-L-E-I-N. And anyone is obviously welcome to follow me there. Okay, I'm going to post your Twitter also on our show notes page today, tomwoods.com slash 2042. And I'll just end by saying I'm glad I've gotten to quote unquote, know you. But in particular, I feel like I was especially happy to see what your opinion was on this because I just kind of thought, well, it goes to show there is there is a sign of life in, in the old girl yet right. you know, in, in, in New York City, right? Still some hope. Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad you're going to fight and dig in your heels and represent everything that's best about that place that you and I both love. And I hope someday... I'll be able to come back there and you and I will have coffee together without showing anybody any papers. I'm with you, buddy. I'm with you. I hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot, Eli. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. All right, folks, before we wrap up for today, I want to tell you about something I'm doing next month. That is, as we're recording this, it's January 2022. 
and I'm going to be in the penthouse of a major Las Vegas hotel in the middle of February. And as a matter of fact, on February 15th, I'm going to be hosting a fundraiser and meet and greet in the penthouse for Angela McArdle, who is running for chair of the Libertarian National Committee. She is outstanding. She is full of energy, full of principle, and she is going to rectify a lot of the problems that we have seen in the party, in particular, the very, very bad lackluster messaging about lockdowns and other COVID-related restrictions. It's been a very, very bad showing by the Libertarian Party. And Angela, who is as rock solid on those issues as it's possible to be, intends to turn that and many other things around. So I hope you can join us for that. I obviously, because it is a hotel room, it's a big one, but I you know, can't have a billion people in there. I can only have so many people. So please do, if you want to attend that, please do sign up for it as soon as you possibly can. And the sign-up link for it is tomwoods.com slash Angela. So head over to tomwoods.com slash Angela. Once you're signed up, we will send you a note as to the exact location. Now, I won't, myself won't know the exact, exact location until the day before when I get there and check in. So I don't exactly know what room I'm in but I'll let you know what hotel it is. We'll be in touch with you, so don't worry about that. But do please join us if at all possible. It'll be a very nice evening. Angela will talk and we'll all mingle and you all get to know each other. So do please try to do that. Make an effort. TomWoods.com slash Angela. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.